If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Any reasonable man who is not bound by prejudice or fanaticism must surely admit that any book which is collected and finally collated from sources such as these, uh, date palms on the one hand, skins on the other, white stones on the other, bones on another hand, and from the infallible memory of human beings, can hardly be dogmatically set forth as a totally accurate record. That is something which is just contrary to all principles of reason. There's hardly reliable support in the origins of the Quran for the dogmatism of the Muslims that this book today that we have is a perfect, complete copy. We just cannot see where the evidence is that the book itself is, in fact, complete. What evidence exists to show that that which Zaid managed to collect ultimately turned out to be exactly what had been revealed to Muhammad, nothing more, nothing less. There's no evidence to this effect. The collected text today, the textus receptus, in other words, the widely received text, can hardly be proved to be the textus originalis, that means the original text, on this uh, pure foundation of the discretion of one man and the length that he went to by himself to try and collect the book. There's no evidence in Islamic history that Allah ever went about in his own way ensuring the collection of the Qur'an. The text which the Muslims have today comes not from the uh, special power of Allah in any way, but purely from the discretion of this one man, Zayid, who however sincere he may have been, we accept that he was utterly sincere in his effort to collect the Qur'an, however sincere he may have been, Nonetheless, one does not see here any evidence which can substantiate this wildly dogmatic claim that this book is a perfect, complete copy, letter for letter, dot for dot. The uh, form of the origin of the Quran, the sort of things that this man had to resort to, date palms, white stones, and things like this, and the infallible memories of men, not at all. The memories of men are very, very fallible. And therefore it is somewhat surprising to find that despite this very fragile uh, form of resources that Zayed had, the people today make such dogmatic claims in consequence. I want to say that, as many Muslims today suggest, that there were a number of Muslims who had memorized the Qur'an by heart, and therefore it could not be lost or changed in any way. My reaction to that is that if that was so, if they were in fact a large number of Hafizun, in other words, people who had learned the Qur'an by heart, one who learns the Qur'an by heart today is called a Hafiz. If there were such men among the Muslims in those days, in such large numbers, then one would expect that this man, Zaid, would hardly have to go to such lengths to collect the Qur'an as to date palms, white stones, and things like this. Surely, if there were indeed a number of Muslims who had memorized the whole Qur'an by heart to collect it would have been the simplest of matters. Any one of them could have dictated the whole book to him. But Zaid himself adds these words, and now I'm quoting much the same tradition that I quoted earlier, but this time directly out of the Sahih al-Bukhari, and in volume 6 and page 478 we read that Zaid added these words. I found the last verse of Surat at tabah that is the Surah of, of Repentance, with Abu Khuzayma al-Ansari. I did not find it with anybody other than him. The verses referred to are from Surah 9, verses 128 to 129. Now here is a very important and very relevant statement. He says, the last verses of the ninth Surah, I found only with this one man, Abu Khuzayma al-Ansari. I did not find it he says, with anyone else. Now, that's of extreme significance. That means that 
Although people say today that there were a large number of Muslims at that time who were Hafiz, who had memorized the whole Qur'an by heart, the one man who went about collecting the Qur'an goes so far as to say that this short passage, these two verses are only found with one man. In other words, no matter how many Hafizun of the Qur'an there may have been at that time, not one of the other men, not one, could remember this verse. And that uh, tends to undermine even more this uh, dogmatic claim that this book is textually perfect. In fact, it becomes somewhat clear at this stage how brittle this early collection was. There was no one, obviously, who knew the Qur'an perfectly by heart. There was not one man who could dictate this book infallibly to uh, Zaid dot for dot, letter for letter. Here one has an example of verses which were not known by the overwhelming majority of the people. And I remind you again that this book was finally collected by the discretion of one man, and not by the revelation of the one God. Now let's go a little bit further. Let us have a look now at the text which sometime later was given to Hafsa. Zaid compiled a text, a mushaf, of the Qur'an. And he did so from these various sources that he resorted to. Say, palms, white stones, hearts of men, and so on. So on. And for some time, nothing further seems to have been done. During the whole of the reign of Umar, he was Khalif for about ten years. Nothing further transpired, it appears, in the actual collection of the Qur'an. But after this, during the reign of Uthman, the third Khalif, and this is now many years later, we read that a certain Khudaypa bin al-Yaman came to Uthman. He came from the provinces of Iraq and Armenia where the wars were being conducted. And he said that when the people of Sham and Iraq were waging war to conquer Armenia, Hudayfa was afraid of their different readings of the Qur'an. The book had begun to be read in a different way by the people of Iraq and Armenia to that which was read in Medina. And in Bukhari, Sahih al-Bukhari, volume 6, and page 479, we read, So Uthman sent a message to Hafsa, saying, Send us the manuscripts of the Qur'an so that we may compile the Qur'anic materials in perfect copies and return the manuscripts to you. What he intended to do was to take this one text which Zaid had compiled, and which, as I've shown you quite clearly, could hardly be claimed to be dogmatically perfect when one considers the very fragile, very brittle sources that he had to resort to. Uthman then takes this one text, and he decides to standardize this text as the official reclension of the Qur'an. And now, the whole thing becomes a little bit more brittle, because we find that in the different provinces, the reading of the Qur'an was different in some respects from what it was in Medina. Now, it goes on and it says, Uthman sent to every Muslim province one copy of what they had copied and ordered that all the other Quranic materials, whether written in fragmentary manuscripts or whole copies, be burnt. This tradition then implies, it tends to suggest, that elsewhere in the Muslim world there were whole copies of the Quran which had been compiled independently from Zaid's copy, or else they were partial copies. There were verses, there were surahs, whatever it may have been. There were manuscripts which also contained passages of the Qur'an. And these had been collated, collected, codified, independently of that edition of Zaid. So he was not the only one who collected the Qur'an. Others did so. And what Uthman did was to order that every single Qur'an or manuscript thereof be burnt. Now, there's hardly a Muslim in the world today who would burn any portion of the Qur'an. Yet Uthman resorted to a very drastic measure. And these Qur'ans that he ordered to be burnt were Qur'ans that had been compiled and collated by faithful companions of Muhammad himself. People like Abdullah ibn Masud, people like Ubay ibn Khawf, and others like these men, who had gone out of their way to compile independent Qur'ans codices of the Qur'an itself, men who were faithful Muslims, who had, as we will see shortly, been very faithful to Muhammad and who are highly esteemed by him. In fact, it seems from other traditions, much more so than Zaid himself. 
it was the copies that these men compiled in all their sincerity as well, same kind of sincerity as Zaid had, that Uthman ordered, ordered to be outrightly destroyed. And throughout the Christian church, we may have our different varied readings in the scriptures, but there's never been such a drastic attempt made to standardize one text as there has been in Islam. Never have we felt that the distinctions between our variant readings are so radical or so meaningful as to warrant the destruction of those that do not appeal to us. In fact, the variant readings in the Bible are so minor, so negligible, that the overall authenticity and authority of the book just cannot be seriously, honestly questioned. But it seems that things are different here, because Uthman resorted to a very drastic method of standardizing one text of the Quran, and that was to order all copies and differed with his copy, every single one without exception, to be burned. It shows that there wasn't one Qur'an, despite all the others that had been codified and collected, there was not one Qur'an in existence in the whole Muslim world which was known to agree with this one of Zaid in every form. Now surely that tends to indicate even more that this final codex of Zaid rested on nothing but his own discretion. It could not ultimately be substantiated as perfect or as correct in every respect from any of the other Qur'ans that existed. There was not one that existed that was like it in every respect. Now, this tends to suggest to us that although there may be such a thing today as one standard text of the Qur'an, this text is purely a repetition of the text which Uthman finally standardized as the correct one, what you could call a revised standard version of the Qur'an. But there is no proof that this is the exact original. Even if we were to concede that the Qur'an which Uthman himself transcribed as letter for letter, dot for dot, the identical Qur'an to that which we have today, we would still say that that doesn't help to prove in any way that the Qur'an which Uthman finally sent out to the provinces was in fact 100% correct. A chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And the weak link here appears at this very point where we find that the Qur'an of Uthman was different to the Qur'an that existed in the other Muslim provinces and that the man who had collected this Qur'an had to resort to very, very uncertain origins and sources to put it together. Hafsa's copy was only one of many copies. What evidence is there that her copy, in every respect, on every occasion, was the correct one when it happened to differ from the others? There's no evidence to support this. There's nothing by which the Muslims can dogmatically say this text is perfect. And there are two final points to consider at this stage. One is that Hafsa's Qur'an, according to the same evidence that we have in Islam, itself was incomplete. After the copies had been sent out to the various provinces, these seven copies, we read that Zaid himself said, and now I go back to Bukhari, volume 6, page 479, a verse from Surah Ahsab, Surah 33, was missed by me when we copied the Qur'an. And I used to hear Allah as a prophet reciting it. So we searched for it and found it was Zayma bin Sabit al-Ansari. That verse was Surah 33, verse 23. Among the believers are men who have been true in their covenant with Allah. So, after these copies had been distributed by Uthman, as the only complete and authentic record of the Qur'an that existed, we find that Zaid himself recorded a verse that was missing. And to compound the uncertainty, he had to search for this verse. He couldn't remember it exactly. And he had to set about searching it. Once again, all these celebrated Hafizun of the Qur'an were unable to furnish him with it, just as they'd been unable to furnish the other verse. The evidence for the perfection of the text of the Qur'an weakens at every point in the evidence that we have before us. And here too, we find he has to find one man, in this case a different man to the previous one, one man who has this text, this very verse, and then he inserts it in the text. It's now added. Uh, favorite Muslim expression is interpolated into the text. We cannot help but draw at least three conclusions from this. 
Firstly, there was no single Muslim in the uh, Islamic world at that time who knew the Qur'an perfectly by heart. There was no such thing as a perfect Hafiz. The second thing is that every Qur'an that Uthman sent out, on the record of his own transcriber's uh, heritage, was imperfect. And thirdly, the presumption must be raised from this, that if one verse was missing, the probability is that others were missing as well. And in fact, if we turn to the well-known tradition of uh, Sahih Muslim, this is one of the two major works of tradition in Islam, the other is the Sahih of Bukhari, we find that he holds traditions in his work, and he was a very careful collector of traditions. He very readily overthrew anything that seemed to lack genuineness, and he only kept those traditions that seemed to be authoritative. He has a number of traditions to the effect that other verses and passages were missing from the Qur'an as well. And I'll quote two of them. The first one is what are called the suckling verses. And in volume two of Sahih Muslim, page 740, we read these words. Aisha reported that it had been revealed in the Holy Qur'an that ten clear sucklings made the marriage unlawful. Then it was abrogated and substituted by five sucklings, and Allah of the Prophet, may peace be upon him, died, and it was before that time found in the Holy Qur'an. Today neither verse is found in the Qur'an. Neither the verse about ten sucklings nor five sucklings. But according to Muslims, this verse, the one was abrogated and substituted by a later verse, and I might uh, say in passing the doctrine of abrogation of verses, is uh, fairly substantiated in the Qur'an itself. But in the Sahih of Muslim we read that there was a verse which belonged to the Qur'an which prescribed ten clear sucklings. And that this was later replaced by a verse which limited it to five. But you read through the Qur'an today, you'll find neither. Here's a second one. Sahih Muslim, same volume, volume 2, going back a couple of hundred pages, page 501. He says, we used to recite, one of the companions speaking, a surah which resembled in length and severity to surah Bar-Ra'at. I have, however, forgotten it, with the exception of this which I remember came out of it. If there were two valleys full of riches for the son of Adam, he would long for a third valley, and nothing would fill the stomach of the son of Adam but dust. And it's very interesting to note that the translator of the Sahih Muslim into English, Mulana Siddiqui, says in commenting on this uh, tradition, this hadith, the words of this surah have been abrogated in the Qur'an. In other words, he is saying that this was, in fact, an original text of the Qur'an, but was later abrogated. Well, be that as it may, whether he's right or wrong, we don't know. But the fact of the matter is, that you have here traditions to the effect that there were other verses of the Qur'an that were missing from the standard text. No way can you establish the dogmatic Muslim assertion that the Qur'an is perfect. That might be the fruit of popular sentiment. It is certainly not the product of an objective analysis of the evidence at hand. It might be uh, something which appeals to the heart of people who fanatically want to uh, hold on to and grip onto this book as the holy book of God and have some kind of external proof that there's something miraculous about it. It might, in other words, uh, appeal to the hearts of the credulous. But for genuine scholars, people who are a little bit more objective, a little bit less unfanatical in attitude, such people will be more inclined to examine the record that exists. What people will want to ask, how in fact did this book, the Qur'an, come about? And the only thing that they will look to is whatever evidence exists within Islamic history. Note these uh, traditions we're quoting don't come from the enemies of Islam or anything like that. They come right out of the companions of Muhammad himself. This is the Islamic heritage alongside the Qur'an in the Hadith, which tells us how this book was in fact collected. And the evidence here, which is quite obvious and quite plain, this does not for a minute support the dogmatic assertion that the Qur'an is textually perfect. It is objective, historical evidence that we have been considering. And the presumption is raised again and again 
that the book is incomplete, if not imperfect, because of the fact that Zaid himself had to recall along the way verses that were missing, and even after him we find in works of tradition that other men quote verses that officially belong to the Qur'an. And this brings me even to a further point. I mentioned that there were two points which undermined this issue, uh, this question of the authority, the textual perfection of the Qur'an very seriously. The first one was that verse which uh, Zaid himself discovered was missing. Now this verse that is referred to by Umar is not something which one finds just in one isolated uh, tradition. This tradition, in fact, is recorded in all the major works of Hadith, the Sahih of Muslim, Sahih of Bukhari, Sunan of Abu Dawud, and all the others. It's a widely accepted and authoritative tradition. And I'm going to read it as it appears in the Sirah Rasulullah of Ibn Ishaq, the very earliest biography and collection of traditions of the life of Muhammad in biographical form. And on page 684 of the English translation, we read these words. God sent Muhammad and sent down the scripture to him. This is Umar speaking. Part of what he sent down was the passage on stoning. We read it. We were taught it and we heeded it. The apostle stoned and we stoned after him. I fear that in time to come men will say they find no mention of stoning in God's book and thereby go astray in neglecting an ordinance which God has sent down. Verily stoning in the book of God is a penalty laid on married men and women who commit adultery. Now you won't find that verse in the Quran today. And Umar went out of his way to point out this fact, that this was part of the book the Kitab, the Scripture, the Qur'an. It was part of the Scripture which was sent down. He says part of what God sent down, of what Allah sent to Muhammad, he says was this passage on stoning. And as a result of this, he says, we stoned, and the Prophet stoned, adulterers. And he says that people in time to come will say they don't find any mention of stoning in God's book, which is hardly surprising, because in the Qur'an today, the only penalty for adultery is 100 stripes, in terms of Surah 24 and verse 2. But Umar says that he was scared that the people would go astray in neglecting an ordinance which God had laid down. It's hardly likely that he would have gone to such lengths to uphold the suggestion that people should be stoned for adultery if the Qur'an had never contained such an admonition. Because if it hadn't, he must have known that he was putting his source, whatever it was, against the highest source of Islam, the Qur'an, which prescribes a hundred lashes. Umar would only have gone to such a length to try to preserve this penalty if he had been persuaded that the original verse was part of the Qur'an itself. And that is precisely what he says. Stoning in the book of God is a penalty laid on married men and women who commit adultery. So it is quite clear that not only, according to Umar, was the capital offense to be uh, brought out in the case of people who committed adultery, but that that capital sentence was to be executed by way of stoning, not beheading or anything else. That verse is not found in the Quran, and that is why Umar drew attention to it. That's why he raised the issue. And one finds in the Sahih of Bukhari, volume 8, from page 539, that this tradition is set out very fully. And I'm going to read it because it helps one to see very clearly how concerned Umar was that this uh, verse of the Qur'an should be remembered. And not only that, but that the verse itself, in fact, formed part of the text of the Qur'an and was not the hadith or anything else like that. And uh, the narrator of the tradition says that he got up in the mosque that day and he says, Today Umar will say such a thing as he has never said since he was chosen as Khalif. Sayyid, he says, denied my statement with astonishment and said, What thing do you expect Umar to say the like of which he has never said before? In the meantime, Umar sat on the pulpit. And when the call makers for the prayer had finished their call, Umar stood up 
and having glorified and praised Allah as he deserved, he said, Now then I am going to tell you something which Allah has written for me to say. I do not know. Perhaps it portends my death. So whoever understands and remembers it must narrate it to the others wherever his mouth takes him. But if somebody is afraid that he does not understand it, then it is unlawful for him to tell lies about me. Let me intercede at this point and say that what is happening is that Umar is going out of his way to sort of uh, give a prelude to what was going to follow. He knew that what he was going to say was not going to be palatable. To suggest that a certain passage of the Quran was not found there anymore would not go down with uh, certain fanatics of the day, like many Muslim fanatics of this day, who were under the fond illusion that the book was perfect letter for letter, dot for dot. And he said that if you don't accept what I'm going to say, then one thing I lay on you, don't tell lies about me. Don't say that I didn't say it. So he goes on, he says, Allah sent Muhammad with the truth and revealed the holy book to him. And listen to these words. Among what Allah revealed was the verse of the Rajam, that means stoning, of one who commits illegal sexual intercourse. And we did recite this verse and understood and memorized it. Allah's apostle did carry out the punishment of stoning and so did we after him. Incidentally, there are many hadith to the uh, effect that Muhammad stoned adulterers. I'm afraid that after a long time has passed, someone will say, By Allah, we do not find the verse of the Rajam in Allah's book. And thus they will go astray by leaving an obligation which Allah revealed. Well, it is quite clear from this passage that this verse was part of the Quran itself. And that Umar was very concerned about this. He was conscious of the fact that it would hardly be likely to be written into the text of the Quran by this time uh, accepted in Medina, a verse which had been largely overlooked and forgotten. But he was very determined at least that the ordinance should survive because he knew that this was something which, in his view, Allah himself had revealed. Now one finds that there is, of course, as to be expected from the Muslims of today who try very hard to establish the textual perfection of the Qur'an, one finds, naturally, in consequence of this, an effort to try to get around this, to try to evade the implications of a tradition like this. And an example is a certain man by the name of Ahmad Shafat, a man who has written a little uh, booklet called The Question of Authenticity of and Authority of the Bible. And he quotes a tradition which uh, it seems to me he has taken directly out of Burton's book, The Collection of the Qur'an. Uh, similar to this one, but which has slightly different implications, and the tradition is this. So that Umar said, The Messenger of God stoned. Abu Bakr stoned, and I have stoned. I am not prepared to, the add, to add to the book of God, otherwise I would write it into the text, for I fear that there will come people who, not finding it, will not accept it. It's on page 62 of his little booklet, quoted from Burton's book on page 77. Burton, in turn, quoting from a book called the as sunan al-Kubra, which is a recent work in the last hundred years by a certain Ahmad al-Barhaki. And in neither of these publications, neither in uh, Burton's uh, book, The Collection of the Quran, nor in Shafat's little publication, is there any identification of where that original tradition comes from. And the interesting thing is that one can't trace it in any of the major works of tradition. Shafat says, which of the two versions are the more original and reliable? Well, because of his standpoint, his presupposition that the Quran is textually perfect, he uh, perforce opts for the second, that this verse is more reliable, because to him it seems to indicate that the verse was not actually part of the Quran, that this was purely an ordinance given by Allah, and that uh, Umar did not want to add to the book of God, otherwise he said, I would write it into the text. I say firstly that it would be surprising to find a man like Umar suggesting that he would write into the Quran an ordinance of God if it had not been there already. Far more probable is the tradition that this was originally part of the Quran. And the second thing is that this tradition is of such fragile authority that it is so weak in its resource, wherever it comes from, that it cannot be accepted by any honest, sincere, objective scholar 
as the uh, authentic one, or the one more likely to be authentic. Because the other tradition we quoted is rooted in every major work of Islamic tradition. Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Ibn Majah, Tirmidhi, and all the others. And therefore, we must conclude that the evidence is overwhelming in favor of the suggestion that the Qur'an as it stands today is still not perfect, that at least this one verse, the stoning verse, is missing from the original text. Therefore, that means that the textus receptus today is not the same as the textus originalis. Even today, we have here clear evidence that it is anything but perfect. It is no good saying, as some naively do, that the Qur'an is its own proof not at all. We have clear evidence within the Islamic tradition, which comes from about the same time as the Qur'an, through the same heritage, to the effect that the Qur'an was not perfectly compiled. It would be uh, taxing our uh, sense of credulity to unbearable limits to believe that on the one hand the Muslims managed to preserve the text of this book dot for dot, letter for letter, without any change whatsoever, while all the hadith the traditions which came down by the hands of the same Muslims are so totally unreliable that we cannot put any reliability on them at all. We just cannot consider a line of argument that goes from one extreme to the other like that. It is far more likely that the textus or receptus today, the Quran as it exists today, uh, is very consistent in its form with what we read in the early hadith of Islam to the effect that basically it is a correct record of uh, Muhammad's revelations, but not to the extent, the dogmatic extent of dot for dot, letter for letter. That here and there, there's good reason to question certain passages, certain verses, and uh, the, the issue of whether the book is complete as such. But now I want to go on to this question of these other codices, because these are very important. These other texts of the Quran which Uthman ordered to be burnt, they give us tremendous light in respect to the original uh, collection of the Qur'an. One of the texts which exists, a certain codex, was won by one of the very closest companions of Muhammad, a man by the name of Abdullah ibn Masud. His text was regarded as the official text of the Qur'an at Kufa. For a long time he refused to hand over his text after this order of Uthman, and for a while it revivaled Uthman's text as the original one. You will know if you know anything about Islamic history, for a start, that for many, many years after the death of Muhammad, Kufa in Iraq, which was a city founded mainly by the Muslims, uh, was a source of much opposition to the basic uh, rule of the, of the Muslim people. And it was from here that the Shiite uh, origin of, Is of Islam really began to develop. And it's hardly surprising to find that there was even to this extent, a division on the question of the uh, correct text of the Qur'an. And I want to go so far as to show you that there is much evidence that his text is far more likely to be a more reliable version of the Qur'an than that of Hafsa, which was just one that had been preserved ultimately to this day at the expense of the others. It is not the original text of the Qur'an. It was one of many and it happens to survive because the others were ordered to be destroyed. But I want to show you why I think Ibn Masud's text uh, is in fact likely to have been a more reliable one. Firstly, according to the Hadith of Islam, he alone, this man, Ibn Masud, was present when the Qur'an was allegedly reviewed by Muhammad during the month of Ramadan every Muslim year. In the Kitab al-Tabakot al-Kabir, of Ibn Sa'd, one of the also the early biographers uh, of uh, Muhammad's life in Islam, collator of traditions in volume 2 and page 441, we read these words. Ibn Abbas asked, Which of the two readings of the Quran do you prefer? Abu Zabyan answered, The reading of Abdullah ibn Masud. Verily, the Quran was recited before the Apostle of Allah, may Allah bless him, once in every Ramadan except the last year when it was recited twice, as allegedly by uh, Jibril, the angel. Then Abdullah ibn Masud came to him, and he learned what was altered and abrogated. 
as I mentioned earlier, worth pointing out in passing, this doctrine of uh, alteration and abrogation is fairly well sustained in the Quran itself. That's the first point. That when, according to Islamic tradition, the Quran was reviewed by Muhammad every year, Abdullah ibn Masud was there, nobody else. And so he was more likely to be uh, a better authority for the text of the Quran than anyone else. Secondly, in terms of the same works of tradition of Ibn Sa'd, page 442, volume 2, we read that Abu Abdullah ibn Masud said, No surah was revealed, but I knew about it and what was revealed. If I had known anyone knowing more of the book of Allah than me, I would have gone to him. So Abdullah ibn Masud said, not only that he was present every year when the Quran was reviewed, but that no one knew the book better than him. He said, if anyone knew it better than me, I would have gone to him. The next thing we read, and now I'm going back to the Sahih of Muslim, volume 4, on page uh, 1312, that he learned 70 surahs of the Quran directly from Muhammad himself. He says, I recited before Allah's Messenger more than 70 chapters of the Quran, and the companions of Allah's Messenger know I have a better understanding of it than them. Shaqiq said, I sat in the company of the companions of Muhammad, but no one rejected his interpretation or found fault with it. So we can see he was the foremost reciter of the Quran. When he recited these 70 surahs right in front of Muhammad himself, no one, not even Muhammad, questioned one verse that he recited. That's the third point. And the fourth point is, and this is of extreme importance, is that Muhammad singled him out as the best authority on the text of the Quran. I'll go now to Sahih of Bukhari, volume 5, pages 96 to 97. And we read that Muhammad said, Learn the recitation of the Quran from four. Abdullah ibn Masud, he started with him. Salim, freed slave of Abu Hudayfa, Mu'ad bin Jabal, and Ubay ibn Kaab. The very interesting statement in this tradition is not only that Abdullah ibn Masud was one of the four foremost authorities on the Qur'an, but that he was the foremost. It is Bukhari who adds these words, he started with him. Whoever the narrator of this tradition specially added these words, Muhammad started with Abdullah ibn Masud, which implies he was the best and the most accurate uh, recorder of the text of the Qur'an. And in the records that have been retained in Islamic history, for example, the Kitab or Masahif, of uh, Abu Dawud, Ibn Abu Dawud, sorry, we find here that there are many, many readings in the text of Ibn Masud which existed at that time, which differed from the text of Hafsa, that which was compiled by Zaid. In fact, thousands of differences. In some occasions we find that the records of the varied readings in other codices agreed with Ibn Masud while differing with Zaid. Ibn Masud had said, volume 2 now, page 444, I learned more than 70 surahs from the lips of the Apostle of Allah, while Zaid ibn Thabit was a youth. Which shows the kind of reaction of uh, this man, Ibn Masud, to the order of Uthman, that Zaid's text was the best one. He says, I had learned 70 different surahs of the Qur'an from Muhammad himself, from his own lips. While this man, Zaid, was still a young boy, not even a believer. And one can see that he certainly believed that he knew the Qur'an far better than Zaid. And surely, therefore, in the light of these four uh, evidences in his favor, we can see that his text was probably a better text, a more accurate text. This is uncontroverted by any other chain of evidence regarding the collection of the Qur'an. This is what you find in the heritage of Islamic history. And if these records, that is a hadith that uh, record these uh, issues about Ibn Masud, if these things are to be rejected, as modern Muslims are so willy-nilly inclined to do simply because it doesn't suit their purposes, or because they are unpalatable, we must ask, on the contrary. What evidence do you have to the contrary? Where is your evidence that your text is perfect? No good saying the text itself. That's no evidence. One has to look outside. 
What evidence is there? How was this Quran compiled that you have today? Precisely how did it come about? If you reject what the Hadith say, then please tell us how this book came about. Because there is no other historical record in all Islamic history regarding the actual collation of the collection of the Quran than that which exists in the Hadith. The alternative is just sheer speculation. Based on, once it comes to speculation, you can base it on almost anything. Presupposition, fanaticism, and so on. But it is our view that if Muslims are inclined to question these records in the Hadith, you know, they don't uh, question other records in the Hadith which are in their favor, but they question these purely because they're unpalatable, because they tend to eat away at this fond dogmatism that the Qur'an is textually perfect. And for no other reason than that, not because they can find any historical grounds to reject this chain of evidence, but because it doesn't suit their purposes. It just doesn't help to back up the suggestion that the Qur'an is this miraculous book, perfectly preserved, letter for letter, dot for dot, from any kind of uh, incompleteness, corruption, error, variant reading, or anything like this. We can only say in conclusion that we Christians just cannot share their spirit of fanaticism. We are trained in objectivity. We are taught to think rationally, with a sense of reason about everything we approach. And when we approach the textual history of the Qur'an, and we find in the Hadith, which comes down in Islamic history, side by side with the Qur'an, as the record of what went on at the time of Muhammad and in the life of Muhammad, there's much in the Qur'an that is totally unintelligible without the Hadith. We find that we're, intend, we're inclined to place some store by what is said here simply because, if for no other reason, there is no alternative chain of evidence. And the evidence here is simply this, that this book is not textually perfect, as the Muslims claim. And this brings me now to a last question, and that is these variant readings. We've mentioned here that Abdullah ibn Masud's text varied in certain points with that of Hafsa's, and any Muslim may say, now you produce your proof. You produce your evidence. Don't just quote as a hadith which says they were different. Quote some examples. Well, I'm going to do precisely that. Some people say, some Muslims, that the variant readings spoken of in the hadith were purely dialectal. In other words, it was different vowel points that were at stake. But the actual consonantal text of the Quran was not something disputed about. It was just the different vowel points which were left out in the early days. My response to that is that since the early Qur'ans had no vowel points anyway, it's hardly a ground for destroying all the other codices. This is a very weak line of argument. These other Qur'ans of Ibn Masud and others had no vowel points either. So if the difference between Ibn Masud's text and that of Hafsa, for example, was purely dialectal, in other words, in the question of vowel points, one can hardly ask why the text should be destroyed when the text did not record the vowel points anyway a very uh, unacceptable line of reasoning. The fact of the matter is, and now we go back to evidence, the fact of the matter is that they were real consonantal variants. In the written consonantal text of the Qur'an of Ibn Masud, we find vital distinctions between his text and that of Zaid. And I'm going to give you some examples which follow. I might even go so far as to say that some of the larger commentaries of the Qur'an from some of the most well-known commentators of Islamic history, men like Tabari, Zamakshari, and others, refer to these variants and quote some of them. Books, as I mentioned earlier, the book of Ibn Abu Dawud, the Kitab al-Masahif. These books actually record these variants. This is where these things are found. And Arthur Jeffrey, a well-known Islamic scholar who was in Cairo for some time, collected these and he put them together in a book called Materials for the History of the Text of the Qur'an. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available.